So yeah, as most of you know, I'll, I started here since September as a yeah, research fellow at Deep, and so I presented in I think March uh, this year about all the work that I did about stochastic PDEs and cell motility models. But this time I thought maybe, as we had no speakers, so we do a little informal talk about another project I'm working on, a project about evolutionary dynamics. And I'm not evolutionary dynamics in a way that most ecologists will know the term, but we'll come back to that later. So this is a project that started years ago with a physicist, uh, Joshua Dijksman, who's now at the uh, here at the University of Amsterdam, but he was back in the days at the University of Wageningen where I met him. So he started thinking about this idea of you know, using more physics kind of techniques in evolutionary modeling somewhere back in 2015. And then it took years before this whole idea started was sort of taking off. And then you had to send it to, you know, um, journals like theoretical ecology and they were like what are you doing this has nothing to do with ecology and then things had to remodel remodel remodeled and students had to be involved and it was a long took a long lot of time before you know people like me a mathematician people like Joshua physicists before we wrote something that actually resonated with the you know the editors of journals like theoretical ecology so that's the whole story and so what I did for, for today is it is more of an informal as a complete presentation. So I mentioned some other works in this direction and we'll go through a paper that we actually got published and a paper that we are still working on. And of course the idea is that um, there are still many things in my head constantly you know, evolving. I mean, I think these drafts that I'm writing at this point, I think they have some sort of change 100% every month. So that's not really a productive way of writing articles, but this some sort of shows that I'm still thinking about a lot of things here. And of course, what the idea is um, give a lot of input. Um, so I presented this something about these results, I think last year when I was still in Wageningen. So the whole room was filled with people who know stuff about ecology. And I don't think I came past slide one. So many questions they had about the whole setup of the idea. So I expect people like Andre to, you know, um, have a lot of comments. So and now the arrows doesn't don't work anymore. Probably I have to shift to your uh, yeah probably if you just yeah indeed so now this works of course so the main idea is why one do we want to study evolutionary dynamics and one of the key ideas behind this is the so-called paradox of plankton <clears throat> this idea going back to the 60s and of course one of the main questions about ecology is I have a question, a question. Yeah. is it possible to uh, save oh. <laughs> Probably keep my yeah, this yeah. water bottle out of. Yeah, yeah, it is a lot. Great, yeah. This limits my elbow space. Okay. <laughs> um, so the idea is um, why is there such an enormous biodiversity on Earth? I mean, you just look around, you can just see, especially, of course, in the case of the plankton, you just take a bit of ocean water and you count all the different algal species, phytoplankton species, plankton species, just it's a huge number. And of course, if you think about classical Darwinian evolution, there should be something like a optimal species. You have all these, if all these plankton species, they all compete for a limited number of resources. And this means that the most fit species should outcompete all the other species. And this is of course something that we do not see in happening in biology. And so sort of this idea is called the competitive exclusion principle. If you have, let's say you have a ocean and you have like say five resources, then if you write down a simple uh, resource consumer model where you have all these different algal species competing for a limited number of resources, let's say five, then you can show that in a steady state at most five species can survive and all the other species have to go extinct. Now this, as I said, this has been proposed this paradox somewhere back in the 60s. So you can imagine that by now there are lots of reasons why, for how to solve this paradox. And of course, there are many, many ways you can go. Of course, there are people who just claim the reverse paradox is the opposite. There, should, there are too little species. We should expect there should be more than we see. So you're just completely turning the whole thing around. You can argue something like there is spatial hetero heterogene heterogeneity. Well, for us in the whole ocean, yeah, let's, you can say in one patch of the ocean, a certain species has an advantage, and in the other patch, a different species has an advantage. Now you get mixed in ocean currents, and the spatial heterogeneity prevents 
um, explains why this sort of limited idea of ODE modeling uh, does not work. You can maybe argue that the resources are not the sole limiting factor, maybe competition within the species. There are many reasons. Yeah, things you can write down there. And of course, one of the more mathematical appealing ideas that the system is just never in a steady state. So you can prove in a steady state species should go extinct. But yeah, is our system in a steady state? Of course, you have seasonal variation. There is weather. There is stochasticity in the system. You have ocean currents moving around. Um, but that's one reason you could argue that, well, the dynamics even in itself, even if you forget about seasonal variation or stochasticity, it's just never in a steady state because the dynamics is inherently oscillatory or maybe even chaotic. So that's one argument. Another argument that you can just say is that, well, the time scale of this competitive exclusion is just too slow to compare it with other factors. Like if you have, of course, if you have two species and one is really a lot fitter than the other species, of course, it will drive the other species to extinction very quickly. But if you have two species that are just, you know, functionally very, very similar, then of course yeah, the one that has a little bit of an advantage will take over, but this will just happen on very long time scales. So sort of the evolution is approximately neutral. There is, okay, one is a little bit better than the other, but this advantage is so slow that the time scale on which this, ex the time scale on which one of the species has to go extinct is just so slow that in the meantime, of like climate change, evolution, or whatever happens. So this idea that, of course, for the exclusive competitive exclusion principle, the idea is, is that this ex this competition happens on time scales shorter than evolutionary time scales, but maybe that's just not the case. And there are other mathematical approaches. For example, one of the thing on the last here is so-called trade-based community ecology, where we just assume that all the properties that a single species had, for example, plankton computing, competing for resources in the ocean is uh, conserved. It means that if it wants to increase its capability in consuming nitrogen, then it has to reduce its capability to uh, consume some other resource. Can I ask a, a quick sure. question? Sure, yeah. So <laughs> this all uh, assumes uh, that this competitive exclusion is never observed. But isn't is that true? I mean, in many of the ecological uh, systems where they introduce an uh, exo, I mean, this invasive species, species, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like an invasive species, yeah, it takes over. Mm -hmm. so that's the uh, competitive exclusion principle. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. Yeah. How, how does that? So I, I cannot. No, of course. In that case, we do see it. If you introduce a species that is significantly fitter than all the other species, yeah. then, then of course you will see that it takes over. So it does occur, but even significantly fitter is not okay. I mean, there are experimental tests could yeah. be showing, even with plankton, could be showing that there is a competitive exclusion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, uh, I mean, so yeah. They, so I'm not saying, yeah, so we're films, not saying. The film's work from the 1980s uh, that documents that competitive, mm -hmm. competitive exclusion principle is clear. Yeah, so it's, I'm not saying that competitive exclusion principle does not exist. It's just, these are just lists of why we do not really observe it, or why do we see more plankton species than we would expect uh, there to be? Could you yeah. say a bit of the time scale because the evolution very long, so that's everything. So what would be mm -hmm. what, what you would say like a typical slow time scale along to a long time scale? Well, oh, first name species. Yeah, right? First name species. Yeah. Then we, we can talk about like with mm -hmm. other organisms. So, yeah. Uh, what? 10 generations? Yeah. Yeah. That is this fast time scale. But no, that's actually uh, the, the, I think that 10 generations is a time scale in which you can see uh, evolutionary change. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and that's not and slow at all. I mean, you depend on three species. Of Indeed. So that is it's, it's very fast. Indeed. So that's why you really can. That is why at this point is probably also true. Indeed, that you just these evolutionary time scales. Yeah, really mix with the time scales of the competitive exclusion. And that, yeah. And of course, there's also this whole concept, of course, of genetic variation. I mean, one plankton species is not one with this very specific trait. Of course, there is genetic variation. If you also take genetic variation into account, you can just say, okay, if something happens, then maybe you get that a certain part of the genetic variation goes extinct, but maybe another part then gets 
so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah there is this constant interplay between all these factors and of course it's not that one of these things is the truth they probably all these things on the slide here probably play a part in the whole discussion of the paradox of the plankton and probably every ecologist has his own but can you favorite restate the paradox because I, I remind you the paradox is not clear to me there is no paradox no? but that's a fair yeah. well the paradox is uh is proposed by Hutchinson in mm -hmm. the yeah uh, basically you have three nutrients that find the plankton species compete for uh, mm. so and uh but we see lots of different uh plankton species so mm. how is this possible yeah. Okay. That's what so you would, mm -hmm. expect, you would expect that actually the, the dimension of the resources is low, whereas the dimension of the consumers is high. You know? Yeah. But you know, one of the things that you totally leave out here is predation. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so yeah. and, uh, you know that are just uh, um, in the context of this, like these paradoxes and, mm -hmm. and the existence of biodiversity. It's very important to think about the dimensionality of the environment that species live in. And mm -hmm. if you restrict yourself to resources, yeah. the dimension of the environment is three. Yeah. There are zillions of, of, of predators around. So that increases the dimension of your environment yeah. and hence also increases the possibilities of those. Sure, yeah. So indeed, so probably, I mean, I've got now, is it five yeah. points on the slide? And probably, indeed, it should be a six point predation. And probably, if we ask more, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's in the I'm not the sole limiting factor. Yeah. Actually, there is a paper by Simon Bobin from 1969, I think, so mm -hmm. kind of showing that you know what you really, what really counts is the number of limiting factors mm -hmm. that yeah. species are exposed. Yeah. So uh, to come back to your question, I mean, is there a paradox? So yeah, I would say there is no paradox. It's just that we are not yet there to understand all the factors that are into play. But if we just would understand all the factors that come into play, then there would be no paradox so it's not a paradox in the sense of you know philosophical paradox or it's just that we do not have enough information yet and that's then some sort of catchily that is that an english word catchily rephrased as it's yeah it's a catchy name. name yeah it's a catchy name paradox and then who yeah and is it feasible to do such a process in a data driven way so would you get the system where i have access to all these <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very well very interesting question i mean this this the same the same thing happened to me i've also asked this kind of question yeah. well the same thing happened to me i also asked similar questions to ecologists and like just answer basic question what kind of data do we have available and then Indeed, the amount of data you have is, well, we have this ship that sails over the ocean. And then at some point in space, it just, you know, takes up a bucket of ocean water and counts species. And that's about the information you have. And then the boat comes around a year later, you know, you don't have this. You would like to have from a whole grid in the ocean from the several hundred meters deep you would have. Yeah. And again, you all measure one thing. And then you the, the plankton. So indeed, so you should also measure all the other things in the ocean. Yeah. yeah. So if you want, indeed, so you need, and have no idea how many billions of euros you need to so actually if, measure. If yeah. Entire communities and yeah. Their interactions. What we have basically is only snapshots. Huh, yeah. Time. Like that, they go out, they sample everything in an area, and they look into the thing, stomachs, like mm -hmm. what eat, who eats whom. I mean, I always claim, like, well, if you look in my stomach, there's probably a fly in it that I forgot to watch for my salad. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, who knows? Yeah. It's just data limitation. Yeah. And by the way, this also proved my point that if you have an ecologist in the room, it is really hard to get past slide one. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so the first paper I want to discuss today is this um, thing. So this is from um, uh, Posfai, Pelletier May, and Wing Green from 2017. So this got published after Joshua Dijksman started thinking about this whole thing on himself, being a physicist in a vacuum. Um, and what is the idea here? So I thought this corresponds to this last point here on the slide. 
is in this case, we just assume that there is some sort of a bound on how much species can consume. So the idea is we have just a whole bunch of resources, we have a bunch of species, and these resources, uh, they get replenished by a certain replenishing rate, and they get consumed by the uh, species in the system, and the species in the system, they can consume the resources. And this alpha here is a function that describes how your grazing rate depends on how many species there are, of how many resources there are in a system. So you can take it linearly if you want, but typically people in ecology take something like called a monad function, so just bounded exponential growth. And people and ecologists can have endless discussions on what the shape of this alpha and this beta should be. But typically think of something like um, something like this. So this means that if there are more resources, you don't necessarily um, consume more. Like for the simplicity, you can also just say a linear function, whatever you want. Can you identify S or S? Here? Yeah, that's the next step. And so S means, um, so S is how good is um, species J in consuming all these different resources. So SJ is a vector that describes um, how well, so that the interaction coefficient between species J and resource I. And this resource is nor, and this strategy vector is normalized. So this, this strategy vector SJ completely defines the species J. So of course, so if you have five resources, then this is a five by one vector that describes the interaction coefficients with all the five resources. And so what we here assume is that this resource vector, that the thing is normalized in some norm. And in the case of um, this article, the phosphor article, they just take the sum. So they take P equals one. Just the sum has to be equal to one. So this means that if it wants to increase, if a species wants to get better in you know, consuming resource one, it has to decrease one of the other resources. Uh, yeah. you, can, you can interpret it as kind of like that species J spends um, X amount of time. Yeah, this is also called, cool. yeah. Consuming resource I. Indeed. So it has to, this has to do with budget. I mean, in literature, it's often, yeah, it's often called budget, indeed. So it, it has just, during a day, it can just spend so many hours on consuming food, and it has to distribute this time it has on, yeah, or the resources. It, yeah, it's a constraint on the system, yeah. But and in, so, is, is the, because in your, uh, in the paper that you sent around, Mm -hmm. You all you only study in one section the dependence of beta on Ri. Most of the I mean, paper that you study, the paper that, that was the old uh, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first uh, there you start I uh, analyzing actually this system, but you drop its dependence. Yeah, so it's in the in the third part of the paper that yeah that we wrote, this thing is absent. Yes. And I have opinions about it. So that is why the what was your opinion about it because that it should be there. Yeah. Yeah. I, and know, that's, as an ecologist, I just say like I, I saw that uh, set of equations yeah. and I thought like, okay, there's going to be a lot of mathematics on a on a model that well the point is that the mathematician in me was also not happy that this thing was missing. Because it's because, because it's on the boundary or near near zero. Indeed. So you, you just all kinds of yeah, you just go through zero indeed. Yeah. So you, you really need this beta here. Yeah. So that's why the second part of the paper has this beta in front. But that's also so the thing is that the paper I wrote, but so together with Joshua and a student, uh, Elena, it's a bit of a Frankenstein monster in some <laughs> sense. Because of course there are all the original ideas that Joshua had and are the ideas that the student brought in and then when they were almost finished, I came along and said, well, but hey, I have opinions because I'm a mathematician. And then lots of things were reworked, but of course we didn't want to delete all the old work that had been done. So it's a bit of a mishmash of ideas. So yeah, in an ideal world, I would have infinite amount of time and just rewrite the whole paper in a way that I would see fit, but yeah. Sure. So I don't understand all the equations. Properly, yeah. but the interaction between 
different type of spaces as well? Or is no, there is no. Um, yeah, so the the interaction is only indirect via the consumption. Ah, yeah. So there is no explicit competition model here. Right. It's just very simple species competing for the same resources. Okay. Yeah. And of course, if one species consumes a lot of one resource, that has a negative effect on other species also wanting to consume that resource. Uh, if there are no resources created by a species, I eat something. No, I so, um, something so this SJ, so here we assume that all the um, elements of SJ are positive, it means that they only consume. And of course, you can also, in more extensive systems, you could allow negative values for some of the coefficients here, meaning indeed that one species produces of excre excretes something that yeah. can be used as food for the other species yeah. that's a yeah uh, but then it's uh, then it, it inhibits its own growth rate so yes the negative, yeah. negative value of s is more like i produce a toxin that, yeah that that's also some other yeah. guy but i i don't i die from that's also sure there's also a possibility and of course then the like, whole you know, and then of course the whole idea of the normalization factor then also Becomes, becomes weird. If you allow negative values here, then yeah. the idea of normalization yeah. becomes weird. So of course you can yeah. Example, yeah. Yeah. yeah indeed yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then sure, but the rescaling Yeah, then you need probably to extend this system in some way that it allows for this kind of sorry negative interactions. Can you, so, can you actually identify the, the meaning of data? Because that seems to be a mysterious function. What is data really meaning? Data. No, beta is this one of these functions over there. That means that if there are no resources, you consume nothing. If the amount of resources starts to increase, you start to in, con, increase your consumption linearly. But when the um, there are a lot of resources, your sort of consumption. So it's the non-linear. It yeah. And of course, you can also make it linear. I mean, yeah. I know, okay. as long as it, I think. Yeah. Now, I just wonder if alpha and beta aren't they the same, uh, only a constant? Yeah, they're they're the same up to a constant. Yeah. yeah. Of course, they don't have to be, but in our in my interpretation, they're always the same up to a constant. Yeah. And then, uh, and it's not on the paper you wrote this, it's also like a human step model, but I'm yeah. not the expert to measuring. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that doesn't matter or? Um, if it, at least it makes the system more tractable. So that's, yeah. that's one thing. And of course, this is also one of these historical things that the moment I, came into this project, it was decided that we do not use the degradation of the resources. And then, and for example, also in this article, they don't use it. And in one of the others I will cite, they also don't use it, but they mainly then discard it on grounds of, yeah, it makes the mathematics more complicated. So whether or not that is a valid ecological argument, that's of course a whole different story. But, uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, the, the ecological, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the way you write about here is very yeah. clear in the uh, ecological yeah. application. Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, when I saw this later in the paper, I just thought, like, okay, this is, in, this is interesting because it, it's a kind of neutral model. That's yeah. Neutral, uh, because, uh, all species forage according to yeah. the exact same mm -hmm. of, yeah. Of, uh, yeah. feeding rate. Mm -hmm. And we produce also exactly yeah. the same, and the only yeah. difference is the time allocation of their mm -hmm. foraging on different. That's resources. right. Yeah. And so, what you can prove in this case is that um, so you have all these different species. They all have a strategy factor, a positive strategy factor. So the, all these strategy factors they span a cone in n-dimensional space. If you have n uh, species. And then the theorem which you can prove is that if this um, strategy vector of this resource vector gamma, if this gamma is in the cone spent by all the strategy vectors, then all the species will survive, independent of how large your number of species is. So this goes completely against the competitive exclusion principle, just to state, in this model, you can just add infinitely many species. 
But you need to describe so, in the corner or inside the corner for inside the go. Yeah, and I will have some pictures, so I'll just now open the paper and then you get oh now of course to track this thing to this was not in in the computer and public policy paper. Right? No, I couldn't use this paper. Oh. Mm -hmm. As in it was behind the it was in the yeah. 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 So then you get this factor. So here we have three resources and three resources with one constraint. You can plot this in um, a two-dimensional space. So all these, these dots here are different resource, uh, different strategy vectors. And then this diamond is the resource vector. So in this case, you can clearly see that the resource vector is outside of the the cone spanned by these three species. So you see that two of the species in this case go extinct and only one survives. However, by the way, I think now that people online can't see this mm -hmm. thing I'm showing now, probably. Anyway, um, it will hear something. Yeah. So in this case, still the diamond is out. So the, study, the resource vector is outside of this cone. This triangle here. So in this case, just two species survive. This is all in line with what you'd expect from the competitive exclusion principle. But now, if it is inside this thing, then you can see that all three survive. But now, if you add significantly more, so here we have a lot of species, and still the thing is outside, then you see that only one survives. But if you now just add another species, such that this species, this strategy vector, resource vector is now within the cone spanned by all these species, then you see that they will all survive. But when you mean cone, is that convex hull? Like yeah, the convex hull, yeah. So in this in this case, it's just part of the, yeah. the line you draw, the boundary you can draw all these um, oh. species. But I also noticed that the, hmm. uh, the one that survives is the closest to the resource vector. Is that, is that what that is really? It means that the most reducted resources. Yeah, I'm not sure. If, sure if that's a theorem, but it no, it sounds like an illogical thing. And indeed, you can see it here. The blue one is surviving, and here the orange one is surviving. Yeah, but in this case, you see that the blue and the green survive. So why the green survived and the red? Yeah. Okay. I, I wouldn't say wouldn't be able to explain that from this picture solely, but yeah. Well, it's closer to the line of green blue, but I don't know if that's yeah. happening. Probably, yeah. yeah. And that might also be dependent on your on the choice of the gamma. I don't know what kind of values for gamma are, but um, yeah. are, are used here. But does this play a role? How do you uh, mean? I mean. The value, so you have this replenishment rate for all the, yeah. the, the three mm -hmm. different resources. So yeah. that's the gamma that you want, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, there are three resources. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the black point? Yeah, the black yeah. point are the resources. Yeah. The black point is gamma. Yeah. yeah, and they are, and this factor is normalized to fit in this triangle. Yeah. So the moment you back to the triangle, everyone survives. Yeah. And this means that you can just add infinitely many species in this case. And of course, this is this is some sort of you add this constraint. So you have in all of resource space, this is not possible. You will get this competitive exclusion. But if you add this some sort of one constraint on the system, and all species have to work on this constraint space, then you can suddenly get these kind of ideas where all these different species work together. But is it that yeah. they are abundant in different proportions? No? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it what you can see. Be, that's what you can see here in the end. It must be related to how close you are to this vector. No? You, 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 so part of you away from the vector, the harder it is to. For the, the, I mean, the orange is on top and the yellow is on the bottom and the yellow is this yeah, thing there. So, yeah, probably you're right indeed. Yeah, it must be some sort of, it almost seems like there's some sort of a steady state. Uh, and in general, mm -hmm. every type of thinking. I mean, okay, I'm, yeah. but you know, it, it's Russian. Mm -hmm. It's a vector defined in Russian, so, but this fraction is a race, so it's not finite. So that, that's why you can make infinite uh, species. Or how can you make infinite species with infinite research? 
And but the point is, of course, that the more it's neutral, it's all neutral. Yeah, but the more, of course, the more you add, the more species you add, the smaller the individual populations will get. Oh, so there is some population. Well, not as well, yeah. because they all have, to, I mean, because they, they share the same yeah. uh, beta and alpha. No, but you can, of course, what you can do is you can plot the sum of the resources versus the sum of all the biomasses. Then you just get a 2D plot, and then you can see that this converts very fast to one fixed point in parameter space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So indeed, the R's and the S, the resources and the biomasses are in some sense con and not conserved, but they converge to a fixed point. So are you going to explain why this is the case? Or I'm um, well wondering, I would also think I think if you have this that there's some kind of negative frequency dependence or so. Maybe a negative frequency dependence. So that they're all stable. Hmm. It would be that if they would be more abundant, they reduce the resource more than they use, I guess. Why I, I'm just wondering why this is true. Okay. Well, of course I can give you a I guess scroll down and show you the proof but i'm not sure if that's what you um, you are after but so so uh, maybe intuition you can think about like so do it, you know the optimal foraging theory yeah. right so you have two resources and you basically choose like which one is more optimal to consume mm -hmm. yeah it's mm -hmm. state that the optimal uh, foraging is always that these two resources are in such an uh abundance and it doesn't matter how much time you spend on one or the other. Yeah. Any combination of, right, of, 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 of fractions will, will, will be able to, mm -hmm. to survive. Yeah. So uh, this, is, this is similar in that yeah. you have kind of some, mm -hmm. you, you end up in a neutral state. Yeah. So the environment is, yeah. is neutral in the sense that any combination of, uh, of, of, of fractions yeah. spent on foraging uh, one or the other. So it's a very it's unstable in a way. Well, as soon as you make one of the betas different, yeah, because you, you then you they have now all things collapse. They're all is yeah. all their budgets are one. If you would give one uh, of the species and budget one plus epsilon, yeah, then of one. course probably the whole thing would collapse again. Okay. Yeah. And why does it only work when this is inside the area defined by the other species? Well, I guess that if you're outside of it, then yeah. just the advantage of the this one species yeah. is just. Big. Too big. Or the mm. or, uh, so one of the resources is then probably too too uh, uh, mm -hmm. too high. So that you know, as I understand, there is a condition in these systems of ODEs where you have you want always finite and J's to get this con. But the question: Can you tell anything about the size of this con? Like. Uh, is it very big? So then, if the if the world would be like that, we always but stable. Or... You can fill it up, right? I mean, you can completely, yeah, indeed. So you can just well, now that we have the stable equilibrium, you can just add add more, add more as you want. You can the only thing you can't do is remove that one. So you can remove the purple one. That's fine. You can add as many as you want. That's all fine. The only thing you can't do is remove <laughs> the orangey, yeah, orange species there then the whole thing's collapsed and of course then of course they started using terms like keystone uh, species but if you remove this species then your whole ecosystem collapse whether or not so, that's yeah. so so if the one if this orange dot which is inside actually retains something which actually goes on the other side the whole thing is gone yeah or as long as the orange dot stays the yeah. so, okay. well of course if there's an off i mean if it remains here but there was a new offspring created so evolution is not yeah if the whole species would evolve of course to there then the thing would collapse but evolution works more like there is a small group that breaks away and forms a new species then the orange thing would remain yeah that is true but does it, that is all neutral does it mean if you preserve let's say the the, the Frequencies, then it will yeah. there will be a difference. Yes. Will there be, yeah. I think it's the neutral and yeah. the stability is the same. And I'm no. thinking there. Yeah. Well, no, I think no, I think you're right. They have to return to kind of these resources have to return to ah, fixed yeah. combinations. So. Yeah, of course the resources always the fixed point of the resources is fixed. Yeah. yeah. But I think that 
so yeah, the concentration of the resources is fixed. You can compute it and you can't change that. But whether or not you can change the frequencies of, I think this is actually, this picture is quite dependent on your initial condition, if I'm correct. Yeah, but usually with, with the neutral situation, you would expect that, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah. So, so um, is the constant death rate of the consumers also a strong condition or can you actually relax that um i guess of course if you allow for variation in the death rate then of course a species with a smaller death rate has a advantage over the others yes. so again so probably that would probably, yeah also so in some sense this whole system is artificial in the sense that you have this all these kind of constraints of all these all the all the alphas the betas and the deltas are all the same and all their budgets are the same and then you get this but of course this one sort of then for me at least serves some sort of as a starting point of thinking about maybe neutrality or what kind of advantages do you have and so in the case of plankton in the oceans probably they're all not all the same but there are many many plankton species in the ocean that are functionally very very similar and have all kind of same budget constraints so probably this doesn't reflect the typical batch of ocean perfectly but it may be some sort of serves as an extreme example from where you can start thinking about evolution as some sort of the opposite of the competitive exclusion principle where just in this case just three species survive it's some sort of a opposite of the i mean in the same way that of course the guy who introduced neutral theory hubble yeah yeah i don't think hubble believed neutral theory to be exactly true but it is mainly some sort of it's it's some sort of proposed as an extreme point of the spectrum and maybe in some sense you can think about this set of equations in the same way as some sort of an extreme point on the spectrum of where all these species are very similar okay okay so yeah. can i ask a technical question yeah so to i mean when i do this type of analysis for a kind of mm -hmm. reactions the easy way to do is just look at the steady state nothing changes so you yeah. put everything to zero and uh, yeah. solve the equations okay can you do that here as well and uh, learn something from it or is it uh, yeah yeah i mean it sounds like the simplest approach right? i mean of course these kind of i mean in the first place this theorem that if it is in the, the cone spent by the specialty vectors then the whole thing survives that's of course all this is all done in the case of the steady state so all oh, the yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. but is it easy to understand this behavior from this type of treatment because on yeah. the OEEs, of course, in general, well, not trivial to solve. I mean, yeah. Solve it. So, within this, in this case, so if you indeed ignore this, uh, if you ignore this mu factor here, which they actually do in the computations, if you ignore this mu, then you can do a lot of things by hand. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But can you see the same type of outcome from this? by hand treatment or is this does it really require a, a numerical study no no you can do these things by hand huh? i mean the proof of the theorem is by hand yeah the, of course the proof is yeah a proof is by hand yeah yeah okay. but, but of course if you can if you don't know like, no, but, no, but if you don't know like, first, uh, so if you go back to your first equations right uh, this one or no, no, so, well the system that you actually showed in the slide yeah because that is slightly different and um, i have to put my mouse back here so look at the look at this oh. look at the second equation. Yeah. So it's uh, you know it's uh, you only have to look at this uh, term within parentheses. Yeah, it should be zero. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> that should be zero right? yeah. for, for a species to coexist. So, yeah. <clears throat> and that gives you just an uh, yeah. but also a steady state. No, a steady state is also correct. Yes, as long as n, uh, the ends are positive, yes. Yeah, yeah okay, now n is zero, then it's extreme. Mm. But yeah, the, uh, the steady state condition is this s times l times the delta. Right, yeah. right. Okay, and, I, I, and mm. 
you know, you can just think about like the, uh, even if I have, uh, uh, so if I have three resources, so I have yeah. three member, my alpha is, it consists of a three dimensional vector that is somehow uh, constant, constant values. How many combinations of the S, S, the three S values mm -hmm. do you think dream up that make it equal to delta? That's a lot. It's a whole plane. Anyway, um, and of course, so, but these kind of things that we're talking about now, these, these things have been studied. I mean, of course, um, how evolution works in dynamical systems has been studied long before. Now we get to the slide about evolutionary dynamics in a way that theoretical ecologists uh, think about this. That is, <laughs> yeah, this, this is, <laughs> so I'm probably going to say something stupid now. So <laughs> we, just, we can time how long it takes before Andre makes a comment. Yeah. Um, so we just look what we, so what we do is we look at the stationary state. We just take a system, maybe one of the systems we saw in the pre is in the article, some group of species living together in a steady state. And of course, the question is now, if we introduce a new species, and of course, in this case, a new species mean introducing a new vector S bar, I call it, can we find an X bar such that this growth rate is positive? Of course, if this S bar exists, then this means that if you would add this species to the system, it would just you know, become a part of the system. If this doesn't exist, then it means that some sort of this whole system is at its maximum capacity or whatever term you would like to use. And of course, then note that the, in this case, it's R star here. So the, all the, the steady state of the resource, of course, it all depends on the whole system. So whether or not this S bar exists depends on already the existing species. And now the idea is, is that you can some sort of construct a. Oh, wait, wait, oh. wait, I mean, the, the uh, matrix S that you uh, talk about yeah. here does not include S bar, right? Yeah, okay. indeed. Yeah. 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 So. so you are at some point, you have this whole matrix S of all the species in the system, and then you can introduce a gradient flow by saying, okay, we, in, we introduce these new strategy vectors, and if it is positive, we go. We follow that some sort of direction of strategies that are useful to add to the system. So then you can just, so what you do is you can define a gradient flow on the space of strategy vectors. And what you're then doing, then you effectively you just have written down an ODE in the case of, yeah, if you have N, of, uh, N components in your N resources, then you get just a gradient flow on an N dimensional space. And that is just something you can study using ODE theory. You just compute the, compute the zeros of the system. If you want to know if they're stable, you can compute uh, Jacobians, Hessians, all these kind of things. That is just basic ODE theory. I mean, it's not easy to do necessarily for a given system. I mean, it can be very messy, but of course the whole theory is, in some sense, just becomes ODEs. But just a clarification, so yeah. this only includes the existing species or are you uh, aiming at introducing new species so you're, you're thinking of adding new species not so you extend this gradient. Is that no you're not really so some sort of this idea of adding a new species is some sort of a justification for where the gradient flow should come from if you know what i yeah, but I mean, yeah. we have an idea that okay, we have given some species vector and yeah. a couple of species, and some are very low in populations, and mm -hmm. they need to gain something. Yeah, but so the thing is that the, the population oh, okay. sizes are not really important. So you're really defining a flow on the strategy. on the on the strategy vector space. So you sort of you step away a little bit from um, looking at ecosystem dynamics. You're only looking at parameter, at, at parameter dynamics. Yeah. But, but, uh, I can I can see that you uh, that you can use this approach to uh, look at uh, whether or not the state of a system is equally mm. stable. Yeah. But 
If I just look at the dynamic, the gradient dynamics, what does it represent ecologically or evolutionarily? Because, you know, it's like, uh, it's a kind of, uh, a kind of dynamics in a uh, constant ecological yeah. uh, setting, but mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a strategy that is not yeah. there. Maybe can I ask you, but I'm confused. Yeah. What is the purpose of this? Maybe that's the better thing. Are you well, trying to find what is the optimal strategy? Yeah, indeed. So, so sort of, the, the, indeed, and so that you're looking for optimal strategy. So if we go indeed to the uh, next paper, so the so you want to find an optimal strategy for a given set of, uh, uh, of species. Yeah, is that it? That maximizes their equilibrium state at the end. Well, it's non-invadable. No, no, right? No, it maximizes the invasion. Yeah. The capacity. Indeed. Of the species. So which is the invader? Yes. So what, what are you trying to do? Try to maximize this difference or to minimize it? Because the gradient can go both ways, no? You can either go maximization or the minimization. Well, yeah, so you want indeed, so you want to go to a situation where you are stable against perturbation so you want to go to a situation where adding another species to your system does not lead to this other species actually growing so you want to actually assume that it must be zero so you have all these differences these different vectors the origin difference term should be zero that's what you want yeah of course because you are in a steady state so all the species that are in the system they should have a growth rate of zero because you're in a steady state right. and all other species that you're going to add will have a negative growth rate they die. they die that's some sort of the state where you want to converge to and the yeah. state and you can find this that's yeah. the state of your existing community and not like the one invading so i think a lot like a yeah so yeah, it's looking for an evolutionary yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, indeed. So that is indeed this is exactly where you're going. This is what is called so the zeros of the gradient flow are called evolutionary stable states. Yeah. And by the way, evolutionary stable states are not necessarily stable. It's just a bit of a but misnomer. But yeah. Because if it's negative, it's not there, it's stable. Well, I mean, I'm any not... any. any uh, extinct species is very stable. It doesn't do anything like that. The, the ultimate stability. The only, uh, yeah, but stable yeah, but yeah, thing, no? yeah, probably you could always extend your matrix with zero rows, but yeah, I'm not sure if that makes your system more no, interesting. This is what I'm asking. So, I mean, this whole procedure seems to actually say. We want everything negative because then everything dies and that's the most stable state that we have. Everything that's not there should die. Yeah, I mean, because if there is nothing, then if you then introduce a single species, this has all the resources available for consumption. So that would have a positive growth factor. If you have no species, adding whatever species you can think of will have a positive growth rate because yeah. it can just consume but whatever there is. Change. Yeah. But you have to avoid it. No? So yeah. it's, um, this is what I'm trying to find. Yeah. I mean, this is. Yeah, yeah. You want to avoid, you want yeah. to have a community where no other possible strategy could grow in. Yeah. Okay. And this is sort of a visualization of this process. So, this is the same system as we studied um, before, and maybe it's good to um, first introduce this paper. So, this is by Caetano, Dispolatov, and Dubelli, which are quite famous names in the whole theoretical ecology physics based approach kind of background yeah and so what they do here so here we get again at the same page so we start with a strategy vector here and we assume that we are in a steady state or at least the resources are all in a steady state and now we just add little perturbations to all the strategy vectors and then we can see, okay, if this strategy vector is successful, we just keep it in the system. And if it pushes some other species out, then we remove the species from the system. And of course, it's comp computationally easier than just simulating the full ODEs because then you have to simulate the whole system of ODEs. So just they assume resources are in a stable state. 
I mean, now you just look at perturbation fertility factors if they are effective, we just add them to the system. And if they are lead to a negative growth rate, we just delete them from the system. And by adding small perturbation, again, sort of start stepping through this resource base. And what you can see, and so this is the wait, wait, wait. what's on the axis actually? What are we just uh, uh... so these are the three um so we again we're in three dimensions, yeah, but then three dimensions respected by one condition, so you get two-dimensional yeah. thing. Is and that the resource? Is it the yeah. resource dimension? The resource. Yeah. The resource yeah. dimension. So we have three resource dimensions, yeah. and we have one strategy factor in the middle. So it just took the strategy uh, the, the resource factor, so the replenishing rate to be exactly in the middle. Yeah. And then you can see um, that some sort of all these different points are stepping into this direction towards the um, central point and it's sort of spread out as a cloud around this strategy vector and of course the longer you wait the more you will get and of course this is, these are all stable states because this resource vector is clearly in the convex hull of the yeah but this is not really contradicting your earlier statement that if you start on the left side everything dies except for one yeah there is only one, right? So in this case, there is only one. Oh, there is only. Yeah, oh. or there may be one or two. You can maybe introduce a new species, but then maybe the old one uh, dies out or the new one dies out. And so you get some sort of, you step with several species, you step through the whole resource space. till you add, get to the point where you are around the strategy vector. So there must be one step in the procedure which actually does some mutation or some new variant. Something. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. And then in the end, you end up with some sort of a neutral dynamics around this fixed point. One yeah. question you say you don't have to simulate the ODEs. Is that because you know if a new strategy can invade, it will always replace the old one? Maybe I should rephrase this. They don't simulate the resource factors, but they do simulate the um, biomass, uh, yeah, just the equations for the species themselves. And they give but, the yeah, but I must say their description of how they make these pictures is, let's say, very limited to, I think, two sentences. And it's a bit of a mystery what they do exactly. But there's some so sort of. Can you unlimitedly calculate the stable research values when you know this? Indeed. Yeah, so indeed, so this, um, this black point here is also the evolutionary stable state you find by doing the gradient flow towards your evolutionary stable state. I mean, this is just and, fixed, no? So they just keep it there. Because that yeah. sounds like a very unlikely situation. Okay. You, well, I mean, you start up in the middle and, you, and then you assume that it stays in the middle? No, you, you, start, you start here. You start yeah, here. You resource, the resource. Yeah, the resources are just completely fixed in time. Yeah. And that's, of course, something we can start discussing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the resource inflow is fixed. Yeah. The resource inflow is fixed. fixed. But, but, but your... Uh, but I think your alpha R changes when you have this gradient dynamics on, mm -hmm. on, the, on that on that S. Yeah, your indeed. Your alpha R changes. Yeah, and that's uh, and, yes. and and there's indeed the the the, the assumption that every time mm -hmm. that the S changes, then the uh, you assume ecological stability in mm -hmm. your R. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Because your alpha R changes. Yeah, so probably they, they probably do some sort of a stepping algorithm where they it's, it's where they, they probably they add a new species, they compute the fixed point of the yeah. resource strategy and plug this into the dynamics for the um yeah, yeah, yeah. because they exactly. what they what they claim is but they they don't explain this, but it's some sort of what I interpreted what they're doing. But they claim that the just the consumption of the resource is just on a quicker time scale than the dynamics of the population. So, but so in this case, you can see that you get this nice spread out around this fixed point. <laughs> but now, oh. uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it should work. But now I have to drag this. Here and then I just have to hope that it is this movie. Yeah, I think it is this movie. Yeah, there are multiple plots there. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a real risk. Private. Yeah, I mean, in principle, all these different dots shouldn't be able to survive because only in the long run, right? Yeah, it's the long run, they shouldn't be able to. But they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, the business yeah. difference is yeah. so small that you have a cost. So there but must now, be, I mean, that's your topic, of course, there must be some noise in the system that yeah. introduced. I mean, so of course, these, these random perturbations you add to the strategy yeah. factors, that is the noise in the system right. in this case. Yeah. And now, by the way, the interesting thing of this paper is that they, um, so they computed these evolutionary dynamics, but they didn't just do it for this case of where um, you normalize the strategy factors by just summing it to one. But they look at general LP norms. So you can just say, okay, instead of just summing, doing the row sum, you can just say, you just take the P norm. And then does it depend on the value of P, what is going to happen? And especially, does it matter whether or not P is bigger than one or smaller than one? And if you go to this next video, here they take, I think, a value of gamma of the normalization bigger than one. So P equals 1.1. And then you get this interesting dynamic. We get the same thing in the beginning. So you move to your evolutionary stable state. But this evolutionary stable state is unstable, which is why it shouldn't be called an evolutionary stable state in the first place. But that's something I can't change. I'm taking there actually. Uh, uh, maybe not. Sorry. Maybe I'm just confusing videos now. No, I think this is here. Indeed, it is stable. Very it is very slow. Yeah. And you can also see that the, the cloud is less spread out. So in a neutral case of the normalization equals one, you can see this is sort of white cloud around the whole strategy vector. But in this case, when you, you have a, the norm is bigger than one, you can see that the, sort of the cloud is, is really centered around the specific strategy vector. But if you go to the Indeed, to the other case, smaller than one. Smaller than one. You see, and then you move to this evolutionary stable state that in this case is unstable. And then you can see that it spreads out towards the different corners of the system. So what you get is you get multiple evolutionary stable states. You have the one in the middle and you have the one at the corners. And this thing is then an unstable evolutionary stable state, and those three things are stable That's evolutionary stable states. Now, nowadays, we talk, we talk about evolutionary singular states. Ah, okay. But does it mean that uh, each species is sort of uh, only consuming one particular resource? Indeed. So this means indeed. So yes, it, such, such. yeah, this specialization. So indeed, so what you get is that if your normalization is, if you have this your p-values if your norm is bigger than one you get that you're yeah. you're dri driven towards <laughs> um not specialization but the opposite of specialization that is Gen that generalization thing that you generalize around so you consume all the resources around the effect mm -hmm. effect the replenishment vector but in the case that the norm is smaller than one you get a specialization and for the people here who are more visually inclined, can you get that from this paper? One gets everything in the other two resources shared or something, or you can only get. Uh, uh... Yeah, so what you can do is so you can, for example, say, I normalized, so if you have three resources, you can say, I normalized the first component, I do the power 1.1, and the second component to 0 0.9, and then you get some sort of that you end up at the, yeah, here, and that kind of oh, thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. But now I have to open this thing again. And now, so for the people who are want to understand where this is coming from. Indeed, exactly. And they have this picture here. So yeah. So you have to some sort of optim optimize your strategy vectors um, on these three different surfaces. So in the case of just the one norm, you just have to optimize your uh, on this sort of triangle here but in other cases it's either convex or concave and this depends on what is beneficial but that's also that you also only you have this uh, hmm. many species coexisting when you have this middle case right yeah. yeah so in the middle case you have many species coexisting and you, this, you yeah. have the entire plane indeed so the whole yeah indeed you can fill up the whole plane in this case you get just 
uh, uh, one and one the one that is aligned with or you get a small cloud around yeah and then of course the question is this small cloud around the strategy the resource vector is this are these all different species or is this just genetic variation within one species and then you can you maybe talk about really thinking about clusters as being one species so this one cloud around the strategy vector is the resource vector is one species with a bit of genetic variation in it. I always think in biology is very unlikely that some things like exactly something. So couldn't you say that phase B is very unlikely to happen? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but then of course the thing is that in so what this claims is that it's some sort of an either or system. I mean, if your normalization is in this case, everything goes to specialization. In the other case, everything goes to generalization. Yeah. And of course, in a real biological system, this is also not the case. Isn't it all uh, specialization? Because I don't I mean, know. Okay, you said it the wrong way. You either have one generalist uh, in the right, uh, in the left one, or you yeah, have, there, but, or you have there, but I mean it in a real biological systems, you have Generalist and specialist. Yes. Yeah. But would you, the populations of these produce three different cultures? Yeah. So just to propagate the farm this space would make that diversity or is not related? I'm not because sure. It could be not uh, uh, complex or complex, but. Yeah, of course, sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact that you have these services all, of course, yeah. correspond to the fact that you normalize everything to one. And of course, depending on which norm you choose, the size, the size whether it's convex or concave. But if you also relax this condition that everything has to be normalized to one, then you get, of course, more. Yeah. So, can, can you identify what it means to actually uh, normalize to one or make it lower? I mean, what is it? Is it really the resources add to one? Is that, yeah. what, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's indeed what I say. So, that is about this budget. That, it yeah. can only be spent as so many hours. So what is, how do you interpret the fact that it's not? Uh, how is this interpretation interpreted? I mean, how do you think about it? Well, so for example, it could be, uh, uh, so if it's more mm -hmm. than one, that means that if they uh, uh, divide their budget, it actually uh, switching between the budgets or is it switching between the, the mode or the resources yeah. is costly or something like that? Is that is yeah. That right? Mm -hmm. so you have to switch between resources it's so costly well yeah of course i can the budget actually switches to no i don't think that's the, that's the total well i think the one is the total energy budget so i could imagine that for example if there's a stress or so that's the total of that energy or if it decreases because you have to spend energy in global stuff. Yeah. okay that's uh, additional energy that has nothing to do with consuming the I don't think that. I mean, By I, the way, I, I think can interpret it as a kind of time budget deficient, right? Yeah. Because uh, because you, uh, because it's like you slice your time up in, yeah. in so many yeah. uh, parts, and you have fixed fixed fractions of your time so you spend yeah. on resource one, resource two, or resource three. Yeah. 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 Then spend time on coping with some stress or so. Well, then. Uh, then you have the less budget. Yeah. Uh, but not a time budget, but you would have, you, you would actually, some, you would some. Uh, but you can see this time, well, maybe that's, I think it's the way you yeah. look at it. I would look at it as like a or energy or protein budget, think of the period of cell. You might you have a membrane, limited space, for example, for transporters. So you can only transport in several nutrients. Mm -hmm. So there could all, be all kinds of budgets, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that has to switch from one resource to another. But that's that's, that's, that's yeah, but possible. yeah, that's no. but I don't think the number is that would if that's the case, it would you would have some norm that you have to add a cost for having non-zeros somehow. Because if you say the time switching time, then it, then it would be most beneficial to have only one non-zero item in your mm -hmm. right? But then it would somehow but, yeah, but, of course, uh, but of course the, the thing is um this is in some sense artificial in the sense that species apparently can survive here with some of their resources being set to zero 
which of course in the case of plankton i mean plankton have to consume yeah. oxygen light and nitrogen so of phosphorus. course yeah phosphorus yeah so of course so depending no so of course in this so in this system we assume that a species can survive by just consuming one resource so if you would go to the case of plankton this is already not a valid assumption because their plankton species need to consume multiple resources because we have again all, all the time we have to respect to s yeah and then uh you have this R, alpha r of yeah. minus 12. Okay. and mm -hmm. uh i your arguments are completely valid but i think that they would actually change these spells and not this and not necessarily this one yeah i mean of course in in, in the case of bacteria you often get this idea that for example if there is a lot of sugar around they will go for the sugar but the moment the sugar runs out then they will go converge to something that or the difference between aerobic and anaerobic metabolization i mean bacteria can switch between yeah, different yeah and you make it indeed. On resource. indeed so that is more you should, should model via alpha not via yeah. the it's s indeed yeah alpha. indeed and if you say like toxic things or so uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't completely agree, but I think it's so. If I would let, look at this as enzyme kinetics, like the alpha would more in, in be a factor, like how we, how um, sensitive is your affinity for the resource. So the S would be a modification of your protein investment in it. So I, I, I do think it's, yeah, it's but, but, it's, but because you normalize the norm. It means that you know uh, it would mean that okay, I invest more in uh, uh, in one particular enzyme than the other, and yeah. if I, uh, I I change that, then I actually mm. you know change how much I also invest in the other enzymes. So if I make if, if I make less of enzyme A, I make suddenly more of enzyme B because I normalize. Mm. Yeah. But the thing is that at this point we're having a discussion that's at a much higher level yeah, yeah. than yeah, yeah. what we're yeah. yeah. And of course, yeah. Uh, but it's about the interpretation of this. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know, maybe the wrong person. So of course. Mm -hmm. And they will explain this is some sort of neutral model, so it only takes this interact, but still we will train stability. Mm -hmm. And my only curiosity, apology for the same statement, I don't know, there is this paper that you can have competition if the competition is high order, like multiple species in the same time interaction, but it's also stability. I didn't read the paper, or I don't know whether people ask to make this, because the stability both scenarios are, are rigid. If you mathematically can you uh, con convert one to another, can you uh, interpret that these R's are creating higher interactions across this, and therefore you have the same result, or it's not possible. Or they are just uh, in stability, but they are not equivalent. So, I'm not sure if I can follow your yeah, question. You can but... see the R as being uh, uh, produced by competition between species. Yes, because yeah. if there is another approach that I'm not knowing the details, but know the result, that if your competition between species are high order, like yeah. their interaction with mm -hmm. that are yeah. beyond two points, you reach a lot of stability. The parent space is very stable very often. And what you say the other way around is a neutral model that also has yeah. lots of stability. Mm -hmm. So who is correct? Or if all both are I, correct, so can you map one approach to the other one? No, I no. Or it's just uh, yeah. well, I, I think that you know these higher order interactions. What you're talking about is mm -hmm. actually one of the ones in the list of, of your first slides or so. It's yeah. like, because it adds actually additional limiting factors. These higher yeah. order interactions it adds mm -hmm. additional uh, non-linearities in the system yeah. that allow for stability. Yeah, for example, the whole 
yeah, interspecies competition is not modeled in this approach, which of no. course it's a, a real thing, but yeah. In or intra? Intra, then I think intra, yeah. Well, why is that a real thing? I mean, like the whole, I mean, suppose the self limiting factors, yeah. yeah but usually self limiting is, is because of the resource. So, yeah, maybe you don't have to model it explicitly in this case, yeah. But, um, anyway, um, maybe it's, it's by the way a good point to move on to um, actually thing we're here to discuss today. That's which is oh, <laughs> <laughs> so already quarter past twelve. So yeah, um, so the thing that I was involved in, oh, yeah, for me, I remember what thing. yeah. Um, so of course, so this is the thing that I started. So this, so this whole thing started as a draft in 2016. And in the end, this has been published in June, 2023. So this, of course, as I said, quite an evolution in this paper as well. And of course, so we start here with this some sort of linear approximation here, which where bad time does not depend on the resources. And as I said, we can have a lot of opinions about what that means. And I don't think it really means anything, but um, don't say my to my co-authors, but I probably already said that from them, but yeah. But anyway, so, and of course, here we have this introduce some sort of evolutionary modeling where at random points in time, we introduce a new species, which is a perturbation of one of the already existing species. So we say, okay, this new, so we say the new species K plus one, it's a perturbation of species J. So you get SJ plus a small perturbation, and then you normalize the thing. And then for this parameter eta here, then sort of measures how large your perturbation is. If eta is very small, then your new species will be very similar to one of the ancestors. If it is very large, then it's not very similar to one of the ancestors. So you're more some sort of doing invasion instead of evolution. And then you can some sort of make these nice uh, diagram of phylogenetic trees of how all species depend on the ancestors. And yeah, then... the, the funny thing about this one was that actually at, in the end you only have five species that are left over mm -hmm. on five resources. So I, I just thought like, okay, nice, but you just end up with the number of mm -hmm. genomes that are. Yeah, but uh, this is of course a very short time. Um, yeah, yeah, simulation. Yeah, so yeah, but, but, uh, so yeah, you start with one species, and then in yeah, the end you have five. So you, yeah, you end up with five, right? Indeed. But of course, if you keep simulating longer, then yeah, you can see that there are more and more and more species happening. And of course, you see all here these nice oscillations, which are all due to the fact that the first equation is linear, so you get these nice uh, oscillatory patterns. And of course, this is all in a linear case, so it's maybe not really the interesting. These are uh, total densities N and R, right? Yeah. So, so, the, so this is the sum of all the resources yeah. and the sum of all the biomasses. Because what I and missed this, in this yeah. uh, in these graphs was how many species there are actually there. Well, that is shown in this kind of. So this is for a single simulation. Here you yeah. can see that indeed from in a short time step. Um, you can get this exponential growth of the amount of species. But then in this case, this is also one of the old things that I don't agree with anymore, is that here the uh, speciation rate depends on the amount of species. So you get exponential growth in the amount of species because the more species there are, the more species will speciate, leading to more species. And you get this exponential growth in, in this amount of species until at some point you count add more species and the thing gets blocked. But in the newer approaches we're doing now, we let the speciation rate only depend on the biomass. So for every certain amount of biomass, a certain speciation will happen at a certain random point in time. And if there is twice as much biomass, the speciation rate will double, but it will not depend on how many species there are. So here you can see that if you have a lot of very small species living together, they will all have the same probability of speciating leading to this exponential growth. But in here, you also on top, but just above that, you say actually the system characterized solely by invasion of events. Yeah. So does that does that imply that you rule out extinction? 
Uh, no, I mean because it is a right. So what it, what this means here is that no, there are there is extinction in the system, so species go extinct here. Right. But what we mean with solely by um, invasion, solely by invasion is that um, we assume that there is no correlate if a new species is added, that there is no correlation with one of the existing species already. So it's just actually oh. we're effectively adding a random a random species, not a perturbation of one of the already existing species. That is what we mean with this add to infinity. Yeah. So of course, all these things I have many opinions about. But one of them, this is one of the interesting things. So what this shows is we have here a total in the whole simulation, 984 species were introduced, and this shows the survival probability. So or sorry, the extinction probability. So in the beginning. The extinction probability is quite low. It means that the vast majority of the new species you introduce will have to will have a chance to start growing and you know get a, become part of the ecosystem. While you will see that in the end of the simulation, the chance for a new species to actually go immediately extinct becomes quite large. This is a sort of a priority effect which you have in if you have a very um, is this some sort of all this consecutive following of ecosystems? If you have a very bare, bare patch of ecosystem, just bare ground, you have a few species in it, then it is really easy for other species to come in. But if you have already a completely functional ecosystem, it's more difficult for um, new species to gain a foothold in this already existing ecosystem, which is called the priority effect. Which is the sort of thing you can see in the figure. You could say all niches are filled. Or... Yeah, that's another way of saying it. Yeah, there are some, yeah, all niches are filled. And now we get to the part generalizations of this approach, where we indeed get to the yeah. one, the one with actually right. our dependent, um, yeah. And what you then can. And then you can also see that in the complete resource versus biomass thing, that you very quickly um, converge to a this vertical line of the amount of biomass that is possible in the system. And then all the rest of the dynamics just on this line of amount of biomass in the system. Is this because the amount of resources is fixed? Uh, the influx of resources is fixed. Yeah. yeah, the influx of resources is fixed. And this means that some sort of the uh, allowed amount of biomass in a stationary situation is fixed. You can just explicitly compute it. And you can also see that if you start somewhere, then it first makes a large dispersion, but very quickly you converge to somewhere on this line. And the whole rest of the ecosystem dynamics, all the adding of species, it all happens on this fixed line of biomass. And then, of course, the question is, so where does this go to? And of course, I did all these things before I actually started reading the things I showed you previously. So my first idea was, well, you have all these different species. So what do they all do? They all just want to be able to have a strategy vector that allows them to survive with the lowest amount of resources in the system. So I just thought, well, that is just a constraint optimization problem. A problem I want to have a strategy vector that minimizes the available, but still has a positive growth rate with the minimum amount of resources in the system. So you just think, how do I do that? You think back to your first year calculus, you get your Lagrange multiplier, solve the system, and then you get the green line. So indeed you see that all the resources, so the dynamics along this, um, this vertical line here, leads indeed in the first place to a situation where you, the species minimize the strategy factor in such a way that they can survive with the minimum amount of resources in the system. But then if you compute on for longer, you can see that um, you converge to the red line. And the red line is the evolutionary stable state as computed by uh, the previous paper, by Cartano and others. So, which, so the interesting thing is, so Cartano really assumed that you are constantly in this evolution, that you're in a stationary state and the stationary Evolutionary stable states are computed in equilibrium. And here we are not in equilibrium. We are just constantly adding species to a system that is not in equilibrium. 
but you can still see that in total we converge to this this to this evolutionary not stable state but evolution singular. singular state yeah which is sort of an interesting result so this this means that this underlying concept of evolutionary dynamics that you're working in a um, stationary state is not really essential for your dynamics and if you don't use this thing of course you can't compute it anymore by hand you have to use computer simulation to do these kind of things but you still convert to the evolutionary singular the stable evolutionary singular state and of course you can do all these kind of computations for general norm general norms and you can see that the whole thing is quite messy a lot of peace hanging around and but you can do these kind of computations and you can see that it all works together but so, uh, so this, uh, wait, wait, this is for uh, invasion right this is for this eta, uh, now this is for eta small so this is for this is for, this is for evolution yeah okay this is for evolution and of course the question yeah so you can say we have a lot of species here and that is your that is also your resource supply thing uh dot there uh yeah uh, uh no so the green is the this green dot corresponds to this thing yeah and the red one corresponds to the that is uh, uh, the evolutionary stable state yeah an evolutionary singular state sorry the stable evolutionary singular state mm -hmm. but that's not identical to the uh, normalized resource factor because we're working here in the case p equals two so I just include the norm and in the Euclidean norm, so you get, so this is the evolutionary stable, st uh, this thing here, this is the evolutionary singular state. And it looks like the LP norm, but it is not the LP norm. But then of course, then one of the questions is, of course, I started this presentation with saying, well, we want to solve the paradox of the plankton, which is maybe a little bit hubris, but so you can see there's a lot of species hanging around here, all these different dots that you would zoom in around this uh, ESS, we just mm -hmm. use the abbreviation. But of course, you can now start a whole discussion on are these many different species or should be interpreted this whole cluster as just one species with genetic variation in it? Yeah, that's something you can discuss about. And of course, I think we're already, I'm talking for almost one and a half hour. So I think, yeah. Same models for genetic variation, like uh, where you put the both like the species and then check whether the genetic variation gives the small change in your final plot, or you, you just have what is half the dynamic system results. Like, I'm not sure. You're modeling a dynamic system with yeah. additional species. Yeah. But you're talking about genetic variation. Why do you include these in your model? Well, this is just the, the genetic variation, the fact that we have all these different species coexisting at the mm -hmm. same time, but they have all strategy factors that are very close together. So then it becomes an interpretation question. Ah, so it's an interpretation. It's an interpretation question. Do we say all these strategy factors very in a very small cone? Is this just one species with genetic variation, or are they all separate species without genetic variation. I see, but there's yeah. no cost, no way to model like genetic variation that would affect uh, your proposal for this competition across this. But there's no, in ecology, you can model genetic variation, essentially. Yeah. Um, but so the thing is, what you, what you, yeah. Uh, what you some sort of would hope maybe is that, like here we get one cluster. What you maybe would hope is that you get let's say six clusters. Okay. And then you can say, we say, oh, we have six species with genetic variation. But in this case, because we have this evolutionary singular state here, it just everything converges to there. So there is in this setup, yeah, there are many species in the system, but there is just one cluster. But wait a second, yeah. are they, uh, you know, you said there are uh, many species coexisting around there, Yeah. but is this, uh, due to the fact that you continuously reintroduce new uh, new yeah. new species, if I turn off the if you turn off the speciation, a, a part of these will go extinct, will go extinct. Not all of them, but um, because we are still in yeah, if they are around the species, in fact, they will survive. Okay. But 
uh, not all these species will survive. Okay, so they yeah. are around the okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I would say, I think they often call them also, I think, uh, also this topic, I think speciation is often not accepted by the other groups that you say that kind of thing. So sometimes they're called pseudo species, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would say it's, it's like, well, because for me, the return of evolution, okay, you say, yeah. well, if you stay there, yeah. then you do some small and perturbation spikes to the system, probably most mm. of them will go extinct. Let's say, because they're, uh, they're neutral mm. together, they're just there because mm -hmm. it's neutral. Yeah. Then say there's always some kind of variation, so you yeah. get some by some small noise, and then I think we're left with one. So then I would say, yeah, well, yeah. and, and yeah. The, the, the whole discussion becomes a little bit, you know, uh, philosophical because all these species are similar anyway in the parameters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. But I also asked you, like, because between other yeah. parks, how many, what does that way? Yeah, yeah and of course, so the, the, thing course, the, so the, the thing, thing is, is, of course, I can. Is, so this whole system is a bit artificial in some sense. Yeah. Now, of course, the question is, can I go to where is my, yeah? Do I have the right thing open? No, no, I just, you cannot. Where is my pointer? My pointer, it's here. So I just open this one and I have to first do this live, which is always a bit dangerous. Can I get Wikipedia? So this is the thing that's still in pro work in progress. Uh, no, oh, I have to use menu and then open the PDF. Yeah. Ta -da. Okay. So this is um, with again with the same Joshua, but also with my previous postdoc advisor and a student. So this is all still work in progress. As you can see, a lot of comments, 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 and here we looking at um, predator-prey systems. And especially, so if you look at this system, let's say here, yeah. So here we have predators and preys. And of course their interaction columns just um, are perturbed in the same way as before. So every time we introduce a new prey species, it just inherits the interaction with the predators from its ancestors plus a small perturbation. But at this point, we also allow the growth rate of the um, prey species to vary. So each prey, prey, prey species has a growth rate R, which just starts at 1, or 1.1 1 .1 in this case. And then we can sort of start the simulation. So at the same time, with every speciation step, when a new species is introduced, it gets this new interaction vector with the predator species or predator species with the prey species. But we also allow for variation in the growth rate. And then you what, get what are the equations here that you've seen? That's, uh, yeah, that's important. That makes, makes an important yeah. uh, element in the story. So, what what if there's a trade off? If you have a higher uh, growth rate, we uh, so here we have and yeah, sorry, first so we have for the predator prey species we have the logistic term plus interaction. Yeah. And for the uh yeah, yeah. predators we just have consumption minus mortality. And of course, that is making so this is also again a bit artificial because we have no competition between the predators and no competition between the prey. So it's uh, so this this interaction matrix is a block matrix in the sense that all the the interactions between the, the prey is zero and all the interaction between the predators is zero. So only the predators only interact with the prey and the prey only interact with the predators. I hope that there is a uh, error in your sign in equation seven because that should be a minus instead of plus, right? Well, I have the minus here in the minus p. Oh, you have the yeah. minus there. Which okay. it might be okay. prettier. Oh, I would okay. agree with yeah. you that oh, it's, no. okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. It might be prettier, but then there are historical reasons why the plus is there and the minus is there. But again, if we start over, I might write the minus there and the plus there, but yeah. So we get this kind of interaction. And here, so what you now allow this growth rate Ri here, you allow that to vary as well. 
and then you can some sort of get this really this concept of clusters you get in the sense that you can see hey we have these different branches here a pretty short time at the beginning you get the branch with the um species that have a low growth rate you have the branch here with the highest growth rate which again branches out so here you can really start thinking about okay are all these species that survive here which are something like there are 38 prey species alive at the end here you can sort of start thinking about grouping them in clusters or there's this whole lower branch which are here and you have the upper branch which are here but within these upper and lower branch you can define several clusters and then of course you can start looking with the interaction with all the predator species and then you can also get this sort of this modularity matrix which oh, how, how many predator species are there I think there were 60 species alive. So fixed 60 men, 38 species mean no, 22. 22 predator species. Yeah. So that's a general rule is for every one in this system, there is for one prey species predator, there are for one predator species, there are two prey species. Which is this sort of average what comes out. But here's, so what you can see here is also that. If you study this modularity matrix, but that's maybe too much for now to go into, is that you can really see that the species that are in this branch, the, the prey species, also interact with a certain group of predators, while the, in the upper branch they interact with a certain group of. Uh, but how do you do this matrix like the classic like correlation between this? Uh, temporal yeah, so so this is the complete interaction matrix, and then we just. Um, at the end of the simulation, so at the end of the simulation, we let the whole thing relax. So we add the fixed state, and then we look at the interaction matrix. And then we just apply some modularity algorithm that sort of classifies the interaction between all these different groups. And then you can see that it indeed splits out into groups. We have this matrix here, which interacts strongly with each other. We have this group that interacts with each other. So this predator, these predator and prey together, and these predator and prey together. While the interaction with the other groups are smaller or less strict, mm -hmm. and this splitting that you get by computing the modularity of the modularity structure uh, completely overlaps with the genealogical history. Mm -hmm. So we just say, okay, just we just ask an algorithm, look at the interaction strength. What do you find? And say, okay, well, we have all these predator species all compete with these in, these prey species. And this is exactly the same group as everything that belongs to the lower branch. And the other one, everything that belongs to the upper branch. So you can really see that there, some sort of a structure in this population evolves. And this, uh, and this is, oh, sorry, yeah. That means if you can cross grain uh, the species in a way that it goes back to a pairwise, it's called pair, pair of prey, and you buy Indeed. So you could, and then of course you can ask the question, indeed. So what are we looking at here? Are we looking here at several prey species indeed interacting with several predator species and then you can look some sort of indeed of the average of this blob the average of that blob and that gives you an interaction matrix yeah oh, and this is actually indeed for the thing that we were after at least in my mind we were after all this time because in the end we want to talk about evolution genetic diversity grouping of species and my battery has nine minutes left so that's we're getting there and this is finally some sort of after all years of trying to actually see this now, some sort of uh, yeah, structures emerging from just one predator and one prey system. So we start with just one predator and one prey, let the system evolve, and then you see these some sort of structures in the but community matrix evolve. Yes. Yeah. You show us one simulation. Yes. So what happens if I uh, uh, start with one? Uh... Uh, one pair of spare prey and predator and with completely different initial density so do I get the same uh, structure do I still get clusters I mean, and you still get clusters but of course the specific shape though let's say the branching at the beginning is quite so I haven't systematically studied this yet but the branching at the beginning is quite um generic right so you often see that the splitting at the beginning of the simulation the dynamics at the end, that's way more random. And that's not something, sometimes you just get one branch or two branches. And of course, you can also see here, depending on which slice you take, I mean, this branch here just went extinct. It's maybe it's possible that this one goes extinct if you just simulate 
a little bit further as well. But, and, and if you introduce, so if now one of the prey species, uh, you know, you introduce a new prey species, right? Yeah. So what do all these predators do? How, how do they uh, start to actually uh, incorporate this prey in their diet? Yeah, it's, that is um, quite uh, fixed because we have this, where is the equation? So we have, we allow, assume this structure for the interaction matrix. Right. So if I introduce a new prey species, that means I add a new row to P, which then means that I have to transpose the thing, multiply by beta, and that gives me the new, yeah, you see it. It gives me the new column for how all the other predator species interact with yeah, but but you yeah. can you can choose the entries of that new row. If the new prey comes in, it's like uh, yeah. all the pre predators will be uh, you know un unfamiliar. With no, it. so what we assume is that because it is a small perturbation of an already existing species, is that okay. the way they interact with this species is also a small perturbation of which they interact with the okay. ancestor species. And the reason why we do this is because we need to have some sort of this structure in the matrix. And that is because I skipped through the whole first part of the paper. In the whole first part of the paper, we just use general uh, log Capitara systems. And I think that was my laptop. So that means that we just could go to lunch. I will not finish with my sentence and finish with your question. And um, what I was saying is so in the beginning, we start with just generalized log Capitara. So we just have no structure in our matrix between predators and prey. And then you get immediately you get blow up in the system because positive interaction values are beneficial for your system. So you start with competition, but after a few speciation steps, you get more positive, more positive, more positive interactions. And then at some point, the whole thing completely explodes. And that's the same thing. So what I showed in the figures, I showed the, the growth rate of the prey species can vary because, well, a higher growth rate is beneficial and there is no limit on the growth rate in the system but if you were, for example change the mortality of the predator then of course a lower mortality for the predator is better and then quickly the thing goes through zero and your system blows up again so it is really some sort of a quest for i want to add no structure to my system and hope structure evolves but if you do that and if you add no structure then the thing constantly Explode. So you need to add some structure, as in this case, a really strict separation between predator and prey, which allows you to build this more complex ecosystem. Yeah, so maybe yeah. if, if you have a higher growth rate, does that mean that if you have a trade do you then are more sensitive to predation? Yes. I mean, this it's also, a, but I think that's also that's part of the classical. Lotka Volterra model, if you just write down the most basic Lotka Volterra equation from Wikipedia and you just look at the fixed points, there is also that if you if a species in growth, if the prey species has a higher growth rate, this does not lead to a higher prey density indeed. Uh, yeah. If, if you have a higher growth rate, you get more predators, and that's why you become more sensitive. Yeah, and you can survive with a lower um, with a lower prey density. So if you have a low growth rate, it means that if at some point you get predated too much, yeah. then your species will go extinct. Yeah. And of course, if you have a higher growth rate, you can survive with lower prey densities. And you can sort of bounce back from lower. Great entity. Yeah. But you have you have not explained how the predator actually evolves. What what did you evolve? Because you talked all about mm -hmm. the, the, the R. Yeah. The, the yeah. growth rate in yeah. the in the in the logistic form. Mm -hmm. But how did you have an increasing number of predators? Yeah, the predators can also just speciate, and then we just only change the piece. Yeah, the piece. Yeah. So they and they are normalized, right? But they're not normalized. They're not normal. No. And that's, well, the thing is that if so, the thing is because I have this very strict correlation between that if this P and P transpose in the interaction matrix, that if 
if the values in the, or the coefficients for the predator get larger, yeah. it's also immediately translates to a higher predation in the prey species, which is some sort of a self-limiting factor because the species gets more, the prey species gets more predated, leading to a lower growth rate. Yeah, that's a little bit of a group that I have tried. No, it's just like, you know, insect rates are increasing by predators. And in, in, yeah. in evolution yeah. of predators, by increasing in insect rates. Yeah. And actually, uh, I think what, what now, you probably see a correlation between this uh, increase in high and the increase in the, in the, in the Yeah, indeed. So that is the yeah, yeah. picture that, so just, just that, was, picture. that was the picture that was there. Indeed, yeah. so there is a, there is a quite strong correlation between the growth rate and the total predation of that prey species. So the higher the growth rate, the higher the total predation on that species. 